Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given us the spirit of truth who guides us into your truth. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would guide us this day and move us not only to hear your word, but to do what it says. And we ask this for our good and your glory. Amen. Well, what do Nero, the Emperor Nero, Martin Luther, Napoleon, Adolf Hitler, Mikhail Gorbachev, Pope Leo X, Pope Francis, in fact, every Pope, Elon Musk, and King Charles all have in common. They are the Antichrist, or at least that's what some people have said. Uh, this is the second in our sermon series on 1 John, and our passage for today, 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 to 3, verse 10, talks about the Antichrist. So I thought I should do some research. I hopped online uh, to that font of unfiltered knowledge, YouTube, uh, to find out who the Antichrist is. And I have done the research, so you will be thankful that you don't have to. Uh, and those were just some of the candidates that I discovered. Um, and I have to say that I learned a whole bunch of stuff that I never knew before. Uh, two American couch warriors told me that they had heard that King Charles is seen by many in Israel as the Messiah. It's all over the internet, people. Just go and Google it. I also learned that I am now terrified to uh, search anything on YouTube because of what crazy conspiracy theories uh, videos are going to come up on my, the uh, my feed because of my recent browsing history. Well, trying to identify who the Antichrist is has a long history. But you may be surprised to know uh, or to find out that the term only comes up four times in the Bible and three of them are here in John's first letter and the fourth is in his second letter. Rather than joining in the speculation, why don't we start with seeing what the Bible actually says here in 1 John chapter 2. In verse 26, John writes, I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. Last week, we saw that the aged apostle John is writing uh, uh, from Ephesus to the churches in that area that he has pastored for decades. And here we come to the one, one of the reasons why he has written this letter to stop people who he calls false prophets and antichrists from leading these churches and the Christians in them astray. In our verses today, John wants them and us to know two things. First, that in Christ you are children of God. So keep on going as Christians. And number two, here is how you can spot false prophets so don't let them lead you astray. And he explores these two themes by setting up uh, three contrasts, They're the three kind of sections of our text. Loving God versus loving the world in chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. Antichrist versus anointed in verses two, uh, 18, chapter 2, 18 to 27. And children of God versus children of the devil Chapter 2, verse 28 to 3, verse 10. So we're just going to work through it together. Let's have a look. Point one, loving God versus loving the world. John steps out of the main flow of the letter in verses 12 to 14 with a two-stanza poem. He addresses his readers as children, fathers, and young men. Uh, now, we don't have time to explore why he uses gendered language, but his main point, is to convey to his readers who they are in Christ. They are those who have been forgiven in his name. We are those who know who the one who's from the beginning, that is the Father, who we know through his eternal Son, through whom he made all things. And we are those who have overcome the evil one, John says. This is not something we do in and of our own strength. Rather, we participate in Jesus' victory over the evil one. 
Our strength, in fact, comes from the word of God in us. So all of this is who we are as God's children in Christ. In verses 15 to 17, John turns from our identity in Christ to how to keep going as a Christian. Or to put it another way, we are to resist all that would pull us away from God. Again, it's one of those black and white contrasts that John really loves. So verse 15, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. John here identifies our three great enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. By the world, John doesn't mean uh, the creation which God has made, which we're called to love, but rather the world as human systems and cultures that are set in rebellion and opposition to God and his ways. This is that temptation to simply go along with the crowd, with the values and preferences of those around us, rather than to let God's word shape what we love and how we live. We all know this uh, temptation and pressure when it comes to biblical sexual ethics in our culture. But uh, this comes in all different uh, shapes and sizes, like a workplace culture of cover-up and bullying, or a friendship culture of overindulgence, or a sporting club culture of gossip. So that's the world. The flesh is our own inner selfish tendency to sin and to turn away from God and break his laws. John highlights the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The word lust here is literally over-desire. It's not that desire itself is wrong. Rather, it's that our desires are all disordered. We want the wrong things or we want the right things in the wrong way. Here it's, uh, he highlights that temptation that enters through our eyes. It's kind of like Eve seeing that the forbidden fruit was pleasing to the eye or King David seeing the naked Bathsheba bathing and wanting her for himself. It's breaking the tenth commandment. Do not covet that desire to possess what you don't have. And the phrase, the pride of life, refers to boasting in what you do have, your possessions or your accomplishments. So this is the flesh. And then finally, the devil is that spiritual being who rules the world, seeking to turn us against God and to destroy us. And in naming him, John strips back the veil of the spiritual reality that lies behind the world and the flesh. So we do battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And loving God means that we resist the pull away from him. In verse 17, John invites us to consider our lives in light of eternity. We resist the world, the flesh, and the devil because they will not last. Instead, we pursue what endures, God and doing his will. Well, point two, antichrist versus anointed. John now turns from persevering in Christ to combat those who would lead us astray from him. And so he writes, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you've heard the, that the antichrist is coming, even now many antichrists have come. And this is how we know that it's the last hour. Notice here that John uh, says there isn't one antichrist as much as many antichrists. That prefix anti can mean instead of or against. And John says that uh, these antichrists have gone out from the church instead of remaining in it, which is a bit of an indication that 
uh, they didn't actually belong in the end. The key test that he gives by which we can discern these antichrists is this. Do they deny that Jesus is the Christ? And so we read in verse 22, who is the liar? It's whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. It's clear what John means, uh, that, that what John means is that these people are antichrist. That is, they're against Jesus. They deny that Jesus is God come in the flesh. And here John echoes Jesus' own words that he records in his gospel. Whoever does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. And if you knew me, Jesus says, you would know my Father as well. John's absolutely crystal clear here, isn't he? The Son and the Father are a package deal. You can't have one without the other. In fact, you can only come to the Father through the Son. The Christian faith is universal. It is for everyone, regardless of ethnicity, of language, of gender, of sexuality, of ability, education, whatever. It's for everyone. But it is also scandalously particular. All are welcome. All are invited to come to the Father. But you can only and always come through the Son. Deny this and you're against Christ and all his atoning work on the cross, the universal forgiveness that he offers, the love that he embodies. And that's because you're actually dishonouring him and his work. Now, just as an aside, for Christians to believe in the uniqueness of Christ does not make us intolerant or judgmental people. That's a false equivalence. Indeed, Jesus teaches us to love one another, to love our neighbours, to love even our enemies. And if we fail to do that, we fail to live the way that Jesus has called us to. In fact, it is precisely because we believe that Jesus is the one true God come in the flesh to die for his enemies that we are called to love even as he first loved us. Well, back on our main topic. So the Antichrists are not so much some big end of days bad guy as much as those who are against Christ who deny his incarnation. If you meet people who teach that sort of thing, John says, don't let them lead you astray. This is why, by the way, we say the creed each week in church. It's a shield to help ground us in the central truths of the Christian faith and also to guard us against those who would deny Christ, uh, whether it's cults like the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or people within the church who who question the incarnation in their teaching or when engaging with people of other faiths, the key question always comes back to this. What do you believe about Jesus and who he is? By contrast, John says, you, brothers and sisters, have received an anointing from the Holy One. What John means by this is the gift of the Holy Spirit whom the Father has poured out on all who believe in Christ. And so he writes, verse 27, As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you. You don't need anyone to teach you. But his anointing teaches you about all things. And as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, so remain in him. Here again, John's words reflect Jesus' own words that he records in his gospel in chapters 14 to 17. Jesus promises that the Father will give the Holy Spirit 
the spirit of truth who will guide you into all truth. And the central truth in which we are to remain is who Jesus is, the Son of the Father. Well, point three, children of God versus children of the devil. In this final section, John sums up another, uh, sets out another clear contrast. Children of God versus children of the devil. And he begins with one of the most glorious affirmations in the Bible of who we are in Christ. In chapter 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world doesn't know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. It is a great tragedy when a child grows up unsure of their parents' love. Instead of feeling grounded, affirmed, valued as a loved child, the unloved child can take into adult life a sense of insecurity, unsure they are worthwhile, lacking in confidence, struggling to maintain healthy relationships. Whatever your earthly father or parents were, have been like, John wants you to know in your very bones that you have a father in heaven who loves you. What's more, he's lavished his love upon you. He's made you his child by sending his son to die for you and by giving you his own spirit. This is who you really are, a loved child of God. And the more you let this truth sink into your hearts, the, the more you look to Jesus and find yourself in him, the less anxious, the more secure, the more humbly confident you will be. John reminds us that a world that doesn't recognise Jesus for who he is may not recognise us either as his children. But that's okay, because we're known and loved by God. And quite frankly, his opinion is the one that really matters. And just as Christ will one day be revealed, so when he returns, we will be made like him. In Philippians, Paul says that he will transform our lowly bodies so they may be like his glorious resurrected body. Anybody who feels the aches and pains of aging can tell you that this is something to hope for. The hope of the bodily resurrection is great news, actually for all of us who at times don't feel at home in our bodies. And it's great news for all of us who feel the weakness of the flesh and are frustrated with our sins, especially when we fail. We shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. As children of God, we are called to bear the family likeness. We will see Christ, and so we are called to purify ourselves just as he is pure. John continues, But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. Oh, beautiful words. And in him is no, is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him nor knows him. 
Now, that is not to say that we will not sin. John has already made that clear back in chapter 1, that we all sin. If we say we have no sin, uh, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. No, rather, what he's saying here is that our disposition has changed. Sin, he says, is lawlessness. It is opposition to God. But that's not who we are now as God's children. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 9, no one who's born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. That seed is the promised Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus. And he gives us a new desire to love God as our Father and to obey him. The contrast of being a child of God is being a child of the devil. And so he writes, verse 8, The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. It's a confronting thought. And it is meant to jolt us awake. <laughs> you see, we all have a choice to make. Are you going to follow Christ or the evil one? Do you love the Father or the world? Will you walk in the light or in the darkness? Will you pursue the truth or go for a lie? The good news is this. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And so in Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, whom God has given us, we can choose the good, to do what is right, to live the life God calls us to. Humble and confident in his love as our Heavenly Father and we as his children. So why don't we pray? Father, this is such a wonderfully encouraging passage. That incredible love that you have lavished upon us that we should be called your children. The extraordinary gift of your son dying for us so that we might receive your forgiveness. The gift of your spirit to lead us, to guide us, to walk with us and comfort us. And yet this text is so challenging for us. That call to love you, to not love the world. To walk in the light and not in the darkness. To live in obedience and not to turn away from you. So give us power by your spirit to live as your children. And we thank you for that abundant mercy and grace that you offer us in Jesus' name. Amen.